Welcome to Make Life Fun. I'm your host, Josie Wheatman, founder of Backroads Coaching, where we pave our own path to self-acceptance. Think of me as your self-love bestie, here to guide you, support you as you let go, rewrite the thoughts and beliefs that are blocking you from loving yourself and living your best life. This season, we are talking business, pleasure, love, money, and of course, all things motherhood. What if I told you that you could enjoy these benefits without the inconvenience or expense of changing your current skincare routine, but by just adding something wonderful and affordable to it, you can have your skin looking more even, firmer, hydrated, radiant, smoother, and even smaller pores. Well, Regila Hydrating Serum is that something wonderful that I'm speaking of. It's perfect for busy moms at any stage of motherhood, whether you're trying to conceive, currently pregnant, nursing, or prepping for an empty nest. Our serum is the clean, beauty, fuss-free add-in you've been looking for. It's formulated to be non-irritating for even the most sensitive skin. It's full of beautifying botanicals and features hyaluronic acid, niacinamide, and vitamin C. This is the ultimate anti-aging trifecta. It sinks right into your skin effortlessly between your current toner and moisturizer without feeling greasy or sticky. It's unscented and also free of toxic ingredients that could harm your health. Get it from Regila's Amazon shop today by clicking the link in the description box. Let the glowing reviews speak for themselves. Reveal your beauty with Regila. Listeners, welcome, welcome to the Make Life Fun Show. As you know, I'm your host, Josie, and today I have a treat. My gorgeous friend, Kate Kirpke, is here today on the Make Life Fun Show. Welcome, Kate. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. I'm already having fun. <laughs> I'm already making my day fun to be with you at the Make Life Fun Show. It's perfect. Yes, it's perfect. Well, Kate, let us hear a little bit about you. What is it that is lighting you up? What is it that you're passionate about? And what got you started in this field of basically mothering the moms and the mom and wellness and how it is related to what like lights you up? Yeah, such a good question. So I am a maternal mental health clinician or specialist, which means that I've really committed my professional work into or around the mental health and wellness of mothers. So I am a licensed clinical social worker and a perinatal mental health counselor by training. And I started here in Boulder, Colorado, a what we call a collaborative care mental health center, maternal and early family mental health center. Collaborative care just means that we're focusing, we're looking at that from that biological, psychological, social perspective of mental health. That's really the lens at which I look at mental health and brain health and wellness. And I spent a lot of my time treating or supporting symptoms of depression and anxiety in my work with moms, whether they were brand new moms or moms with older kids. And quite frankly, Josie, while I really value psychotherapy, I think it's very useful for a lot of reasons. I think one of the things that happens when we are treating depression and anxiety is we get sometimes can get kind of stuck in the things that aren't going well. And it's the opposite of fun, by mm -hmm. the way, right? And so I think I'm really focused right now on helping mothers, whether they're new mothers or mothers with older kids, to think about like, what does it actually mean to take care of our brains and our bodies in the way that helps us feel good? Mm -hmm. Because when we feel good, when we have top mental health and wellness, and we can talk more about what that means, we show up differently with our kids, right? And I am very, it's funny, I often say to the women that I'm working with, you think you're my client, but you're not actually my client. Your kids are my client because through you, we're creating all of this opportunity for these children to thrive. Mm -hmm. So I also have two teenage daughters and I have I had postpartum anxiety after my first daughter was born. So I've moved through the stages of challenge and motherhood for sure. But the truth is that I feel better than I ever have at mm -hmm. almost 50. And my daughters are doing great. And I think there's that direct connection between mm -hmm. how I'm doing 
mentally, physically, spiritually, socially, and how they're doing. We can't separate the two. So yeah. that's what lights me up, Juicy. Is it really, is so good. <laughs> yeah. Changing so the dialogue, good. right? Yeah. How do we talk more about that part? Yeah. Yes. And uh, everything that you're saying is so true. And I came to this realization really early on in motherhood for myself, yeah. Yeah. divinely, somehow, some way. It was just like, you are that it's you, like you take care of you and everything else flows effortlessly. Like, that's right. and people kept asking, like, why do you keep saying motherhood is easy? I was like, because I feel like I found this magic and you're yeah. speaking of it right now. This is yeah. it. So that's please right. speak more to, like you were saying, the top of the mental health and wellness, like, what does that look like? And I would love for you to dive in just yeah, just let us have yeah. it because it's no, so important. Great. It's so true. I love what you just said. So I want to start with that. You said mothering is easy mm -hmm. and people are like, what? <laughs> and it's not that there aren't challenges that come with motherhood. Of course okay. there are. But the way that we approach those challenges and how much in flow we are of just finding our own problem solving ways or seeing it for you know you can look at two sides of a coin right you can look at the one side which is oh this so, is so hard and then you can look at the other side of in what ways does this not have to be so hard yes, right yes. and when we train our brains to think about things with more space and more possibility, mm -hmm. things feel less hard. Yes. So it's not that there aren't challenges, is that the challenges feel less yes. hard and it and it's things flow, yes. right? So my perspective, Josie, on what we need as mothers to get to that place that you're talking mm -hmm. about, right? Because I'm sure <laughs> everyone listening is like, oh my God, how do I have more of that? And it's actually not as hard as we think it is, but I think we need to build momentum towards that. I really think of, mental health and wellness as biological, which means how are we taking care of our bodies and our brains, mm. right? Like literally, how are we taking care of them? Are we getting enough sleep? Are we eating well? Are we drinking enough water? Are we moving our bodies? Are we breathing effectively, right? What are our thoughts like? Now we're moving into psychological, biological, psychological. What are our thoughts and our beliefs that we're making space for, right? Our thoughts are everything, Yeah, you know? Our thoughts lead to how we feel, and how we feel motivates us to make certain choices and those choices make up our lives, yes. right? So we forget how flipping powerful those thoughts are, yes. right? Biological, psychological, social, what do our connections look mm -hmm. like? We know through just decades of neuroscience that when we're in places of connection with ourselves, others and our environment, we feel good. Mm -hmm. Our parasympathetic rest and digest nervous system turns on. And when we're in places of disconnection, with ourselves, others, and our environments, we quote unquote feel bad, our yeah. sympathetic fight and flight turns on, mm. right? So our biological, psychological, social, and spiritual health, which I'm finding more and more amazing data and science backing up this idea that when we have what can be called a spiritual core, which just means that we have a sense of being held in something bigger mm. than ourselves, whatever you want to call that, whatever you want to call that and a sense of interconnectedness, mm -hmm. we feel good. Now, if you look at those biological, psychological, social, and spiritual choices we make, we can lean into feeling good, which often involves fun, and then we show up differently. So I think that can feel overwhelming, but really mm -hmm. there are so many baby, easy, tangible baby steps to get there. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Like when you're speaking to the person who's listening, who's not used to having mm -hmm. to think about their physical, their thoughts, and how are they being in the world and their connection to others, especially as the new mom, because I, you know, my son's going to be 18 months soon. You think I just am here to be a mom. Like, well, how can I do all of these things on top of that? So I would love for you to give tangible, easy steps for that mom to take. That is like, I'm right now. And like you said, I'm in overwhelm, much less thinking about myself, I'm thinking about the other person because that's where the mom brain goes, right? We think if we just put ourselves in the back seat and we just take care of what's in front of us, everything will work itself out. But you're telling us that is the opposite. And I'm knowing that to be true as well. I love your question. I love your question because even hearing 
the part I just made could make someone want to turn off this podcast because it feels so inaccessible. And so, yes, Josie, let's make it really accessible. And I think I'd like to say as a first step, just having the intention is leading folks in the right direction. So even if you're not, even if someone listening is not yet actively engaging in choices in those four areas we just talked about, having the intention to want to engage in choices is already building the momentum because what you know and i know is that motherhood especially early motherhood when we're like just getting our feet underneath us we actually focus so much on what doesn't feel good right and the more we focus on what doesn't feel good the more we notice the things that don't feel good and it spirals and spirals and spirals and that's you know we could look at that from a kind of spiritual lens or we could mm -hmm. look at that from a neurobiological lens because really we're talking about confirmation bias mm -hmm. And when we tell ourselves things aren't working or things don't feel good, we only notice the things that aren't working and don't feel good. So just by saying, wow, I want to mm -hmm. lean in to biopsychosocial spiritual health, just that statement mm -hmm. is starting us off. So if your listeners hang up and that's all they're doing for the next little bit of time, they're on the right direction. Yes, right? yes, I, the tension is huge. It's huge, right? And I think the moment we tell ourselves which gosh, as I say it out loud, we are so set up in the society. The moment we tell ourselves that our job now is to take care of our children, mm -hmm. that's the moment we take ourselves out of the picture. So just by setting that intention, we're inviting ourselves back in. I mean, it feels good even to say mm -hmm. that, doesn't it? So yeah. good, so good. And that's the missing link because we are like, it is out there, like you're saying society, it's out there that you become a mom and your full-time job now, or your however, some moms could do it part-time, but your job yes. now is to take yes. care of this person. Yes. And so you say, just making that intention to say, I matter too. Yes, yes. And I think that also reminds me of something else important. Our brains, especially when we're feeling somewhat threatened by something like early motherhood, which <laughs> you know can feel threatening, right? Our brains like to go into the either or. Am I dedicating my time and my attention to my baby or my kid? Or am I dedicating my time and intention to myself? Mm -hmm. And that is such faulty thinking, yes. right? We want to say, how are we? How am I dedicating my time and attention to myself in service of my baby yes. or my kid? It's all of it. We don't have to choose. We do. We put the spotlight back, back on ourselves so that we can shine brighter for our yeah. kids. Yes. And earlier on this conversation, you were saying like, yes, you're my client. I'm here to help you. But really, who's my client is your child. Yeah. Yeah. Explain that to us more because it's very important. <laughs> yeah. I come from a family of a long line of high achievers, mm -hmm. perfectionist thinkers with a ton of anxiety. We don't have perfectionists without anxiety, right? I mean, the two go hand in hand. And I was raised in this environment and I, and I grew up with a lot of privilege and a lot of opportunity and parents who loved me, no mm -hmm. doubt, right? Even with that, I was raised in this environment that energetically or emotionally didn't feel good. Mm. Right. Because there was so much anxiety in the air my parents were in my, it, in my parents. So it was in the air I breathed. Right. And I struggled with a ton of panic attacks and anxiety mm. when I was a kid, a ton. You know, I never felt like I was sort of good enough or cool enough or X, Y or Z enough mm -hmm. to be embraced. And so I was constantly trying to be something that I didn't feel like I was. Mm. And that internal conflict created so much stress and anxiety mm -hmm. in my body. As I got older and didn't started my own personal journey of work, I began to realize that that anxiety was never mine Ugh. to begin with. Like, sure, I was a kid and there's plenty of things in being in this human body <laughs> that are uncomfortable. And I would have had to learn how to manage that discomfort and move through it anyway. But what I was experiencing as, an, as a kid wasn't just that, it was mm -hmm. actually both of my parents' anxiety on top mm -hmm. of what was mine. And when I think about the work I do now with moms, that's why I do the work. Yeah. So back to your question, right? If mothers, if we can kind of manage and take care of and 
and take personal responsibility for our own anxiety or our own distress or our own trauma or our own whatever it is so that our kids don't have to bear that burden, giving our kids the best, biggest gift in the world. So that's what I mean. Yes, you are my client because you and I are doing the direct work, but who is the beneficiary of this work? Your kids and their kids and their kids and their kids. Yeah, the ripple effect is just, it's ginormous. That's the only word I can think of. Like it is just oceans deep, oceans wide. Like it gives for generations to come. What do they say? You heal yourself and you heal seven generations in front of you and seven generations behind you. That's right. That's right. And it like literally back to your question about how do we make this tangible, simple steps? It starts by listening to a podcast like this. (laughs) You don't have to jump in and have 10 (laughs) biopsychosocial spiritual tasks you're going to do today. That is way too much. It starts by being curious about these conversations Mm -hmm. and understanding that actually we have such a big part in creating the life that we want Mm -hmm. that feels good, that is based on health and wellness. And in doing that, we open up the portal for our children to have a life that they want that's based on health and wellness, Mm -hmm. right? And then they inherently have that and they open that up to their children and on and on and on. And to your point, I agree. I actually think whether you're someone who believes in past lives or all (laughs) the many lives in this one life, we're healing things that our parents didn't have time Mm -hmm. to heal in their lifetime, right? So you're right. It goes in both directions. It goes in both directions, which then you are taking yourself not necessarily out of the picture, but it helps hold you in a place where it's not selfish because that's the word that was thrown around to me at a very young age when I knew intuitively taking care of myself was my responsibility, but the word selfish got thrown into there. And that is a word that will stop you right in your track, especially as a mother. (laughs) It's so interesting, isn't it? Because I really have, that word is thrown around so much and I've sort of in many ways gone back and forth between let's change the word to Mm -hmm. self-full because when we're full, we have more to give. And then part of me is like, what's so wrong with being selfish, Mm. right? Let's take the stigma away from that word because really what we're saying when we talk about quote unquote being selfish is that we're asking ourselves, what is in my best interest Mm. in this moment? And if we go back to what you and I have just been saying, Josie, if I am saying what is in my best interest in this moment, meaning Mm. what in this moment is gonna lead to me feeling happy, healthy, whole, connected, purposeful. If I ask myself that question and I show up more fully, Mm -hmm. everyone around me benefits. So I don't know, let's call it selfish, but then let's stop saying that that's a bad thing, right? We get to redefine it. We get to reimagine it and we get to decide what it's going to mean for us. Because yes, the moment I started saying, I'm going to blow myself up to full to overflowing, because that's the moment that I'm able to give the most. And I'm able to give from a place of such more love, such more tender, such more joy, such more fun. Like you said, when you came in, like, I feel the good energy. Like I feel, I feel you, Josie. It's because I had this full intention when I was going to sit here that I was going to just give my full undivided attention because I let myself be full this morning. I did my practices. I did the things that I know that I needed to do to be in this space of full, like surrender. You said in the beginning that mothering is easy for you. Mm -hmm. And I think that you just actually said so beautifully the why Mm. because you're overflowing you just Mm -hmm. use that word i'm overflowing Mm -hmm. and when we're overflowing it doesn't take effort to give Mm -hmm. and to show up we just do yeah and how do we overflow by giving to ourselves Mm -hmm. so maybe that's a nice time to shift back to these simple what are we talking about like what do we really mean when we talk about biopsychosocial spiritual health Should, should we dive in and kind of give some really clean, simple Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you, ask you some questions so you can help me. Okay. So Josie, let's start with that biological health. And again, this is coming from this template at which I hold and consider mental health and wellness. Mm -hmm. So even though we're talking about things that we don't necessarily offhandedly connect with mental health, we are talking about doing these things Mm -hmm. for our brains. Okay. Okay. So when you think about your biological health and we're talking about your physical body Mm -hmm. and your brain what are one or two things that you know that you need to be physically healthy enough meaning let's not even worry about so physically healthy that you could like 
conquer the world. But let's just talk about like, what do you know that you need to be physically? I know I need fresh air. I know I need to move my body. So for me, that's dancing, that's yoga. I know that I need stillness. I need like to quiet this chatter that's in my mind. I need to just allow it to be what it is. And I know that now, but I didn't always know that. (laughs) <laughs> well, that's actually, so you just made a great point. Some people when asked this question would be like, I don't know. And the first step, just like we said, the first step to open up to the possibility is to want to know. Mm-hmm. I want to know what I need physically. Yes. Okay. So if someone is listening is like, I don't know, then that's the first question to ask yeah. and sit with that. Be willing to not know, but sit with the question. Yeah. You, Josie, are very clear, right? Mm-hmm. You said moving your body, being outside, you know, dancing, you talked about, you've talked about getting still, Mm -hmm. you talked about a mindfulness practice. Mm -hmm. So anyone listening that the thing that they could think about is what is, what are one or two things that I know that I need on a daily basis Mm -hmm. to feel good in my body Mm -hmm. and then to write them down. If two feels too many, just pick one. Yes. Right. (laughs) Okay. And again, we're making this so simple. And if you're already someone listening who knows how to do this, maybe you up the ante Mm -hmm. a little bit. Maybe you add one thing that you're not doing Mm -hmm. right now. Or maybe if you're walking five minutes every day, you say, I'm going to start walking 10 minutes every day. Right. So we really look at baby steps and I call this a non-pharmaceutical prescription in my psychotherapy practice because we go to a doctor and we get medicine to feel better and we take the darn medicine to mm-hmm. feel better. But the doctor doesn't give us the highest dosage to begin with. Yeah, It's to harden our bodies. Mm-hmm. They give us the lowest dosage to get us there. And that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Really simple steps. And that paints the picture so clearly. Right? Okay. How about your psychological well-being? And again, just to remind you, we're talking about your beliefs mm-hmm. and your thoughts thoughts and your emotions. So when I throw those three words, beliefs, thoughts, and emotions, what do you know, Josie, is important to you in those categories Mm -hmm. to help you feel good? Yeah. I need to come back to the fact that I'm worthy. I need to come back to the fact that I'm chosen. I need to come back to the fact that I'm held. I'm supported that I am not alone. Beautiful. That definitely helps me every day of the week. (laughs) Beautiful. So worthy, held, supported, And you actually did one of the ways to practice the psychological health part is to come up with a mantra Mm -hmm. or an internal dialogue that we say over and Mm -hmm. over and over. And those are three beautiful examples. I am worthy. I am not alone. I am supported. Mm -hmm. We know that our beliefs lead to our thoughts, lead to our feelings, lead to our choices, lead to our life. So sometimes people have to work hard to change deep Mm -hmm. internal beliefs to get there. And the first step in that, if someone's really struggling, is just to get curious and question the old belief that's Mm -hmm. in the way, right? If someone's listening and their belief is like, I am not lovable. Is it true? Is it true? Is it true that I'm not lovable? Or another way to ask that question is, what if I was lovable? The what ifs, I love the what ifs. If I believed that I was lovable, what thought would I have right now, Mm -hmm. right? So again, for someone who is kind of new at this, it's just about getting curious, Mm -hmm. right? My favorite, I've got two that I've used over and over. One is that I've kind of learned how to move out all the stuff. And just as I breathe in the morning, my mantra is I am, Mm. I am, I am. That to me, we're moving a little bit over to the spiritual piece Mm -hmm. now too, which is fine, but it connects me to just something so much bigger than myself. Mm. For a long time, I was practicing this mantra when I was walking, Mm. where I would say, I am okay. Mm. I am okay. And it's amazing how many of us walk through life thinking, telling ourselves we're not okay. Yeah. So beautiful. Okay. Biological, psychological, social Mm -hmm. connections. What do you know is important to you on a daily basis with respect to your social health? Yeah, my social health is connecting with my husband, is connecting and actually being with each other. We don't even need to say a word, (laughs) but just being with each other in each other's presence. It's just instant, like release. Instant. Again, I'm so, this is where I get so like sparkly about neuroscience (laughs) because it's flipping fascinating is literally that is when you're being with him, you're in connection and all of your stress is reduced because Mm -hmm. your sympathetic nervous system turns, sorry, parasympathetic nervous system turns on rest and digest. You Mm -hmm. feel that in your body, right? Instantly. Instantly. 
So if someone wanted to practice this sort of, you know, what's the thing you're going to do to tend to your social health, someone could think about any ways of connecting. Can you actively commit to hugging one person mm -hmm. each day, to looking at one person in the eyes, right? You know, mm -hmm. when you're checking out of the grocery store and sometimes I'm like, thank you. And I think I'm looking at them, but I'm not actually really looking yeah. at them. Taking that extra beat to connect with someone's eyes yeah. is like a bath to your nervous system, oh, wow. right? Putting your hand on your heart, mm -hmm. even if you're not saying anything, that's connecting to yourself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, picking some, one of the things I love doing, Josie, is like scrolling in my contacts and then picking one person on there and sending a text that says, I'm thinking about you, no need to respond. So any small, tiny practice and connection mm -hmm. is taking us in that direction, yeah. right? And I think we need to practice that one a little bit harder now more than ever because of the last two years, we were so disconnected That's that we right. almost got used to it. That's right. And I also just really, I want to remind all of us that any of these, we can think that we're talking about big, momentous tasks, mm -hmm. right? But connection can actually be very, very simple. Mm -hmm. We don't need it to think about connection means I have to go out and have a girl's night every Friday night. I mean, that's amazing right. if you're ready for that. I think there's nothing more than being in community with people, but it doesn't have to mean that. It can literally mean doing something kind for a neighbor out of the blue. Mm -hmm. It can mean smiling at someone when you pass them in the street. It can be so tiny. Yeah. When we're, and then we're, this is perfect transition over to spiritual health mm -hmm. because that sense of interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. It is so profoundly supportive of mental health and wellness. There's an incredible psychologist that I've recently, she's my new hero. Her name is Lisa Miller. She has studied the science of spirituality and has actually shown through all exceptional sound clinical data and research brain scans, all these things that what she calls a spiritual core, that sense of interconnected, that mm -hmm. sense of being held in something greater is more protective of depression and anxiety and substance abuse than anything else. Wow. Than anything else. Wow. And some people might call that God and some people may call it energy or spirit or inner wisdom. It doesn't matter what you call it. She does differentiate this from religion, although I think there can be an overlap, mm -hmm. of course, but, but it literally is so protective mm -hmm. to think about being held within a system that is beyond our capacity of understanding. Yeah. It's bigger than life. It makes you feel like you are, like you said, you're small. Like it makes you feel like you are like, like a baby. Like the image I get is you just are this baby who is protected. That's right. And if we lean into that, mm -hmm. we can see mistakes as opportunities or mm -hmm. purposeful, right? We can see failures, quote unquote, as part of the oh, process. Yeah. And I, and we're all going to make mistakes and we're all going to fail at things, yeah. right? But when we lean into that, these more daily, big or small things that our brains can get hooked on and can mm -hmm. turn into self-doubt and self-criticism and all the, we hold those things differently. Mm -hmm. So back to your start, this is so beautiful. Back to your start, we said mothering can be easy. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about. If we but, make a mistake in mothering, we can see it yeah. as not a problem. What do you do if you think about the spiritual health piece, mm -hmm. right? We did biological, psychological, social, now we're into spiritual. What's your daily practice in accessing spiritual health for you? It's just that mindfulness again. It's that yeah. connection to source is the fact that I know that I am held. It doesn't matter what I believe, what I think about myself. There is something greater, bigger than me that loves me more than anything. I can't even fathom <laughs> the amount of love that this universe, this creator, this source has for me. Like I can't even fathom it. Like the love I have for my child, I think is so big and grandiose, but it is bigger and bigger and bigger than that. And so for me, when I have that, when I'm having those hard, hard days that I'm like, oh, I just want to go under the covers, not come out. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, it's okay. Go under the covers. <laughs> it's okay. okay. That's right.
That's right. And I'm, and I'm hearing that word you started with again while you're talking, which is overflow. Mm -hmm. Like that love, when you connect that, it's overflowing. Mm -hmm. And you are part of it. It's yeah. inside you. It's outside you. It's you, yeah. you, you overflow it to your kiddo. Now it's part of him. I think you have yes. a son, yes. right? And he gets to, oh, and then we know that babies are overflowing with love because mm -hmm. they're like ma baby magnets, right? They're like, we all come, right? Because we want whatever that baby's got, right? So right. It, just, it just grows and grows and grows and grows. Mm -hmm. It's so big. So if we are, as we, if, as mothers, if we are tending to our biological, psychological, social, and spiritual health on a daily basis, teeny tiny things, they don't mm -hmm. have to be big. We are doing that in service of our children. And if yeah. someone's not a mother of a child, I happen to see women in general mm -hmm. as maternal beings. So yeah. we're mothering a pet or a plant or a home or a community, right? Mm -hmm. And I actually believe that men have a maternal yeah. part of them too. So mm -hmm. we can even bring this conversation of mothering and what needs to, what needs to happen for us to show up as good mothers, even beyond just this parent, child, mm -hmm. mother, child dyad, right? It can go even bigger than that. Yeah, it can. And I love that you're being so like including all, because mm -hmm. it's true. We all have the feminine, the masculine inside right. of us. And we get to decide what we're activating at any given time, but we're not taught these things. <laughs> That's right. You know, what's so interesting. I love the name of your podcast. And part of why I love the name of your podcast is that we can, for me, fun can feel really burdensome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like I, I'm, I'm just at 50 learning the value of leaning into fun mm -hmm. because I've sort of taken myself and everything in my life so seriously up to this point. Like I didn't love playing with my children. <laughs> Play seemed like, oh my gosh, such a burden. And I think I've loosened the definition of that to understand that again, if I'm feeding myself in the ways you and I just workshop together, I feel better. Those choices lead me to feeling better. Yeah. And when I feel better, I have such a direct access to joy. Mm -hmm. And when I'm experiencing joy, guess what I feel? Fun, right? Do you feel fun? <laughs> that I'm like more, out into the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm more likely to dance in the kitchen or smile with someone or find something humorous or be playful, mm -hmm. you know? Yes, and that is so true. That is like 100% hit the nail on the head that when you're feeding your soul, your mind, your physical body, and your spirit, you are able to include a little bit of fun. If you, like at the beginning, when we started, if you're left with nothing, like the image I have is like this tree that the wind is blowing so hard that all the leaves are just coming off and you have that. So why would you want to have any fun? Well, how could you even? Exactly. How could you? But I think what I am just sort of wanting to get across, which I know you like taste and feel so inherently, is that all we have to do is pause and pivot to get there. So even if our kids are crying and our mm -hmm. partners had a crappy day and there's dishes in the sink and the house is a mess and like life in this moment, the external parts of life feel really burdensome mm -hmm. and overwhelming, we can ask ourselves in that moment, what is a thought I could have that would feel good? Or what mm -hmm. is a choice I could make right now that would lead to joy? So that e it's the both and again, even when the external environment is chaotic. And what do I mean? What's a thought I could have? I love my child. Ah, look how blue the sky is, right? Oh, my dog just walked by and he's so soft. Those thoughts bring up joyful or connecting or good feelings inside my body. So just like that, I've shifted something. And we all have access to that. No matter what our environment is, we all have access to that. And what is neuroscience tells us? Neuroscience tells us that confirmation bias is that thing that happens that when we focus on wh whatever we're focusing on, we're going to have more of. So all of a sudden, rather than focusing on the dishes and the noise and the chaos and the to-dos, I'm focusing on the softness of my pet or the blue in the sky or the wake-up call. It is. It's always there. Yeah. Always. And we just have to shift and, and see it. 
Yeah. And then we see more and more and yeah. more. So the anchors, what it's going to anchor you in the present moment. Totally. And that question that you ask yourself, like what would feel better? That's just a gift that you give not only to yourself, but the chaos that's going on. <laughs> well, right. Because if you're the mom in the situation and you shift your energy or your state of being, everyone else is going to follow. Oh, that's how gosh. it works. Gosh, so true. So what are you doing now at Fabulous Beautiful 50? To bring yeah. more fun and joy in your life, Kate. I'm going to giggle first because I actually <laughs> turned 50 in February, but I'm so proud of turning 50 that I am already saying I'm 50. And then some people are like, don't want to say how old they are. And I'm like, are you kidding? If this is 50, bring it on. Oh right? my gosh. I love that so much. So what am I doing? Do you mean personally, professionally? Where's Personally. Your personally, Kate. Kate. Yes. Great. <laughs> Okay, so here are my non negotiables in my world. One is that I have a very committed mindfulness and meditation sitting practice. And so every morning, actually, my morning routine in general is really important. And I, I think you and I may have had a conversation about this last time we were together, but there's so much talk about how the first 30 minutes of our day really sets us up for the rest of the day. So my 30 minutes looks like I wake up around six. I always lie in bed for a little bit just to sort of have this practice now where I lie in bed and feel the comfort of the bed mm. and not because I want to go back to sleep, but more because I'm like, oh Enjoy. man, I'm starting my day so comfortable. Right. And then I get up. I'm a big coffee drinker. So I love my cup of black, strong coffee. Love it. I read something really sort of a spiritual, some text that feels mm -hmm. good right now. I'm reading this book called Into the Magic Shop. I don't know if you've heard it, but it's by a doctor named James Doty. And he's a neurosurgeon, actually. And one of the things I love, which I'm sure you're getting from this podcast, is I love <laughs> the overlap between, between science and spirituality. It, there's so much overlap. You can talk about it from whatever direction you want, but it's all actually the same. And so he really talks about the magic of thought and intention, but he's a neuroscience. So it's a scientist. Yeah. So it's really beautiful to see the overlap. And then I go and I sit and I have a really, and my sitting practice is very quiet. I follow my breath, kind of settle. I open my heart, get ready for my day. I live in Colorado, so every morning for me involves being outside in nature with my dogs, mm -hmm. and there, and that's my spiritual piece too, yeah. is just connecting with nature. I love my work because I do a lot of this stuff, right? So my one of my favorite things about my job as a maternal mental health specialist is I have I really have to practice what I preach. That feels very strongly to me, and so I just get jazzed out of creativity. I, I really think of myself as a connector and a thought generator and a dreamer. And I have people who I work with who put all that into action, but I get to think up these big ideas and I love that. And I sit with phenomenal women every day. And so being a part of their journey of finding health and wellness is like the best mm -hmm. thing I could ever ask for. And again, I've said this now three times, but I'm holding their children in mind. Mm -hmm. And so I get to, I have that context, which just feels like the next generation. It feels so good. I have a book coming out, which I'm really excited about. That's a Tell big, more. it's called Reinventing Supermom. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. subtitle is Encouragement, Support, and Strategies for New Mothers Who Feel Lost. And it's mm -hmm. really focused at that early stage of motherhood, right when we're getting our feet underneath us. And it really is looking at all of the biological, psychological, social, and spiritual practices or mm -hmm. thoughts or things that we can bring attention to. Yeah. I do think we need to be willing to feel discomfort in motherhood. And so a lot of it talks about how to allow for the discomfort yeah. because that's part of it too. But it was a fun creation. My 13 year old daughter did the illustration for the cover. Oh, so that feels really awesome. That's coming out. It's in production right now. So it Congratulations. should be in my hands. Thank you. Oh, that's huge. You. And I think that subject in itself, like finding yourself in motherhood, like nobody talks about that piece. <laughs> Like I heard all the things about motherhood from everybody, but nobody told me that there is an actual rebirth when you give birth. That's so interesting. I don't mean to dive into a whole other subject, but yeah. I just think it's, can you, what were the messages that you were told that you the grew motherhood up? Motherhood is hard. 
uh, it is hard you have to sacrifice the word sacrifice came in so much like that was what was anchored on my heart throughout even when I kept saying I'm gonna be the fun mom I'm, like that was my belief that I wanted to instill in myself but the belief that I instilled was you sacrifice yourself for your child and that's just what you do no matter what and so that started me off real good. <laughs> that word inherently induces pain, a feeling of pain, doesn't it? Sacrifice. Absolutely. It's like you don't, it's like just in the word is tightness and tension and pain. <laughs> and even when Which you have is, the best of intention too, like I said, I was going to be the fun mom. That was what I went into it. But the moment my child was born, that was so much more powerful because of the pain, because of that emotion. Because when you tie your emotion to something, right, it becomes more bigger, more powerful, more in the world. And so of course that was what was more prominent for me was that, oh gosh, now I'm using sacrifice everything. And I was so, so willing. <laughs> so what, sh so what, ha so your baby's still young. I mean, yeah. 18 months. so what enabled, what allowed you to shift that? Yeah, what and when that did question. that shift? Asking for help. So I had a coach and uh, I uh. had a coach. So I was I was explaining all these things that I'm explaining to you. I am sacrificing. She's like, you haven't got outside. When was the last time you left the house? That question was like, whoo, she's like, get outside. Yeah. And I know that I need that. Cause I said that at the beginning, like that is what I need. I need nature. I need fresh air, but I just held myself up in the house and being a COVID mom on top of that. I just locked, closed the door and I was going to be this mom. And so the moment I started leaving the house, I put Everett in a little carrier. It was like my whole world opened up again, but asking for help, which is not something that we're taught to do. Right. Because it reminds me of something else that's so important in this journey, which is that we can't just give, we have to also receive. Mm -hmm. So it's, so talk to me about that. So you were asking for help, but what was it like to receive help? Receiving help was actually it came really effortlessly to receive help. Cause I told my husband, like, I need a doula. I need this. I need that. I was just like, I just started asking for help, but it didn't, it wasn't right at first, but it was when I realized that I was slipping because I am just a bright, shiny, fun, loving yes, life you person. Are. Like that's just who I've always been. But I noticed instantly when I became a mom, I was losing that and I was losing it fast. And well, I wasn't living near my parents. I wasn't living near my friends. So I had to start reaching out for help. Like it was like life. It was like savers. Like <laughs> it was like life floaties. Like help me because I'm drowning here. It's like it's so interesting though, Josie, because it's like you intentionally gave that away. Mm -hmm. You said being a good mom means that I'm going to sacrifice myself. Mm -hmm. You also just said myself is inherently fun, loving and joyful. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you literally in a part of your brain was like, well, in order to be a good mom, I have to let, I have to sacrifice all that. Mm -hmm. And then you're serious. just left, you're left with like, nah, you're left with nothing. I have to right? be serious now. Yeah. Oh, and go man. through the day to day, take care of your kid, do this, do that. And then just go through the motions. And I grew up seeing that too. And so it was just so easy to move into that for me. And so that's what prompted this show, Make Life Fun and Motherhood, because we so need to hear it because it's not something we're taught. It's not something we see. Yeah. And that's what brought this about where I want all women to know that they get to create the mothering experience of their dream. What do you want it to feel like? What do you want it to be like? Yeah. That's what and you just said it so beautifully. It's <laughs> like the moment you allowed yourself back in, mm -hmm. which is inherently fun, loving, mm -hmm. connecting, joyful, expansive. Once you allowed yourself back in mm -hmm. motherhood, not just became fun, but it became easeful. Exactly. Isn't that so ironic? Maybe that's not the right word, but it's like, oh, it's actually fairly simple. Yeah. Yeah. But we have to, we have to complicate it sometime to get to the ease. And that's why we, ha I have beautiful conversations like this on the show so that we can show that it's possible yeah. so that we can know that it's possible. So we can know that we're not alone. And this beautiful conversation, that is exactly what it's done today. You feel good to be around Josie. And I, I, I had that feeling the first moment I met you <laughs> in real time when we were in person, but you do, you like, like there is a way in which I feel good in my body when I'm near you and your body. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things, just as we wrap up here, yeah. that we really think about a lot in motherhood is I want to feel close to my kids mm -hmm. and I want my kids to want to feel close to mm -hmm. me. 
and we exude things, right? Like I imagine that that baby boy loves being around you because you feel good to be around, right? And it's like, wow, if only we all gave ourselves permission to show up as our most true, authentic selves. Now, not everyone may be as inherently joyful mm -hmm. and attracted to fun as you are. Mm -hmm. I think that's just your soul and your spirit. <laughs> Someone else may have something else just right. as beautiful, but different. But we know, I know it feels good to be around people who are really willing to be their true selves. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I just want to thank you for showing up with such integrity, because even though I'm not your 18 month old son, <laughs> I want to be around you. So it's, it is, you're offering up something to the rest of us. So thank you. Oh, that matters. And I'm going to receive that. Thank yeah. you so much, Kate. Yeah. At totally. this point of the relationship, the relationship. Yeah. Yes. This point of the relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love relationship <laughs> format. This point of the relationship. I love to have, give you the floor to tell us what it is that we can find you, how we can connect with you. Also, what is on your heart? Like after having this beautiful conversation, if there's something that's on your heart that you feel that needs to be said. I think what's on my heart that needs to be said, and I'm going to say it for myself mm -hmm. and offer it up, but mm -hmm. I certainly invite other people to offer it up is that as a mother, I am inherently connected to all other mother beings on this planet and that we're all I, almost, I often say motherhood is the ultimate equalizer meaning we can come from different backgrounds and races and cultures and you know perspectives and interests and genders and whatever it is right we can come from all these different backgrounds and as mothers we all share this common thing which is that we are paving the way for other people to grow into themselves. And that is not a small job, yeah. <laughs> right? And so I just want to offer up my appreciation about being a part of something, again, so much bigger than myself, mm -hmm. that's so interconnected and full of love. I have yet to meet a mother who it doesn't want what's best for her child, whether she knows how to do it or not. We all do. And so I think I want to offer up that participation in that and also an offering for others to recognize that they're part of that because it's huge, right? Mm -hmm. It feels good to me. Thank you for asking. That's yes. a good one. I'm going to carry that with me today. <laughs> it's a good one. And I'm going to take that and receive that as well. So where can we follow you, Kate, to be a part of your world? Thank you. I have a really fun Instagram feed where I offer lots of little tidbits and perspectives and kind of tips and strategies. At, it's at Kate Kripke, K-A-T-E-K-R-I-P as in Peter K-E. My website is katekripke.com. I also have a podcast called Motherhood Uncut, which is a podcast where I'm teaming up with sister friend who's also a mother of teen girls. And we talk about all the stuff no one wants to talk about in motherhood, but often from sort of a, a clinical, not clinical, but we're bringing in research and data and anecdotes and sort of helping make sense of mm. the chaotic things. Josie, I'll tell you that the first season where we just launched episode 10 today is all Deb and myself having conversations, but we'll be inviting in guests next season. And you are a brilliant guest to bring on. So I will be circling back to you. Yes, please. My book that's coming out, people will be able to find it on Amazon and on my website. And I also have a free workshop that I hope that's okay if I say yeah, that right yes. now, because I, I want to offer up, yes. you know, this opportunity. It's October 22nd. You can learn about it on my website. And it really is two hours of opening up just the things we talked about mm -hmm. today, but really giving space for some practices that help us lean into some of this. And the whole goal of the workshop is to bring, begin to build momentum in that direction of mental health and wellness, that biopsychosocial, spiritual health and wellness and motherhood. So I would love to have you and any of your listeners come join. I think it's going to be really fun. Actually, Yay, October absolutely. 22nd, 10 to 12 mountain time. Yep. And that's how it starts. It starts with getting into practice. That's right. Getting that connection and community. That's right. And that's how you, get, that's how you get going. So you that's just right. offered up not only all the tips and tricks, but now you're like, let's get into practice. Let's implement this. 
so and brilliant. with others, right? Mm-hmm. Because I think it's harder to do it on our own than it is in that community where mm-hmm. we're lifting each other up. So yes. that's that. This conversation that's has been brilliant. And I had chills and learnings and findings. And I know that this is going to be a gift to whoever is going to be able to listen to this. So thank you so much, Kate. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Josie. I love spending some of my morning with you. Thank you for being part of the self-love movement. Your support and care matters here. Please be sure to subscribe, review, and share. And get your ultimate daily planner freebie today by visiting makewifefunpodcast.com. When you're ready to step deeper into my vibration and work together, go to backrosecoaching.com. Thank you again for listening. See you next time.